So at ASH, uh, we're presenting results from our phase one, two study of the combination of azacitinine, venetoclax, and gilteritinib in patients with FLIP3 mutated AML. And so we're evaluating this in both frontline and relapsed refractory patients. So in the front line, so across the board, we know that FLIP3 mutations are very common. They're present in about a third of patients. Um, they have therapeutic, both prognostic and therapeutic implications. Um, in the relapsed refractory setting, we have gilteritinib, which is a potent FLIP3 inhibitor that is uh, approved, uh, but we're hoping to improve upon those outcomes. There's some preclinical and clinical synergy for um, gilteritinib with venetoclax in particular. So that uh, kind of led to this combination of the three drugs again, both in the frontline and the relapsed refractory setting. And in the frontline specifically, we're interested in the older population. And for, for those, even those patients with FLIP3 mutations, you know, quote unquote standard of care is still considered to treat them with azacitinine venetoclax if they're not suitable for intensive chemotherapy, which of course that regimen does not currently have a FLIP3 inhibitor incorporated into it. And so, you know, in the frontline cohort, we're particularly interested in how do these older patients do giving them the standard azacitine venetoclax backbone, but also giving them a targeted agent for, um, you know, a flip, if they have a FLIP3 mutation present. So again, there are two cohorts. So there's one for relapsed refractory, one for uh, frontline um, older patients uh, who are unfit for intensive chemotherapy. Um, you know, patients need to be FLIP3 mutated, um, either ITD, so internal tandem duplication, um, or uh, a D835, which is the most common uh, other FLIP3 mutation. Um, in the first cycle, and so I think one important thing about the design is it's important to note that it's not just as simple as combining the three drugs, because you do have added myelosuppression. So, um, in, in induction, so for cycle one, we give uh, azacitine at standard doses for seven days. Um, we give venetoclax uh, daily uh, in theory for 28 days. However, we do perform a, a bone marrow on day 14. Um, and then if the bone marrow is either in remission or a plastic, meaning you know, we, you, it's, we can't get a differential, we hold the venetoclax at that point, which is very important to allow for count recovery. And then in combination with that, we give um, gilteritinib um, continuously. Um, gilteritinib, it was initially a phase one uh, study, so we evaluated two doses of gilteritinib, both 80 milligrams and 120 milligrams. Now, also in, the, in cycle one, at that day 14 bone marrow, if patients are in um, a marrow, if they're, in, if they're frontline patients, so older, newly diagnosed patients, and they're in a marrow remission, we also hold the gilteritinib on day 14, and that just allows for count recovery. Now, in the relapsed refractory setting, we continue the gilteritinib no matter what, um, no matter what the day 14 bone marrow shows, because we know that those patients really need continuous uh, FLIP3 inhibition. So in cycle two and beyond, also, it's very, very difficult to deliver these full doses uh, for multiple cycles. So for cycles two and beyond, we, de we decrease the dose of the azacitinine to five days, decrease the dose of venetoclax to seven days, and then with the goal of giving continuous um, gilteritinib, either at 80 or 120, depending on uh, what phase of, you know, what phase of enrollment the patient was in. So at ASH, we're, we're presenting data on 14 frontline, so older unfit patients, and 16 relapsed refractory patients. Um, so first in the I guess the fir first, first thing is in the phase one portion of the study, which is important in terms of the dose finding of gilteritinib. We initially did evaluate 120 uh, milligrams of gilteritinib, which is the approved dose. Um, we found that, that that combination with full dose azacitin venetoclax is probably too myelosuppressive. We did have one DLT. Um, we had a, a couple remissions, but no patients had count recovery. So we moved on to the 80 milligram daily dosing and found that that was much more tolerable as far as a, um, you know, um, as far as myelosuppression. So the 80 milligram dosing was chosen for the phase two portion of the study. Now, as far as the individual arms and the relapsed refractory population, we found a response rate of 69%. Uh, which was which which we felt was encouraging high rates of MRD negativity and FLIP3 PCR negativity. Um, the median survival, though, uh, uh, was was about six months, which is not uh, uh, which is not what we would have expected. We would expect that to be better than with single agent gilteritinib. Now, it's important to note that in that arm, we did enroll a lot of patients who uh, were very poor risk in terms of their prior therapies, so had prior gilteritinib exposure 
or had received prior azacitine plus, plus venetoclax. So if we look specifically at those patients without those prior exposures, median survival is much more encouraging to, at 10 and a half months. Um, in the frontline cohort, again, we treated 14 patients. Um, all of the patients responded, so we have 100% uh, response rate. All but one of those was a, com was a complete remission, so the complete remission uh, rate was 90, uh, 93%, um, and nearly all of them uh, achieved FLIP3 PCR negativity, uh, so 83% of them were MRD negative by PCR. And so the median follow-up is still relatively short for those patients, um, but it's important to note that there's only been one relapse in the frontline arm, so so far those responses seem to be durable, and the six-month uh, overall survival is 92%, which is very encouraging. Well, the study continues to um, enroll patients. Uh, we're particularly interested in the frontline cohort. So I think we really need to see longer follow-up, obviously. Um, and we've enrolled 14 patients, but the goal is to, you know, obviously to expand that. Um, I think that if these data hold up, if we really do see what appear to be more durable responses by additional FLIP3 inhibitor in the you know, older unfit patients, then my hope is that we can, this can be used more broadly outside of clinical trials, because it certainly makes sense that patients who have FLIP3 mutations, as we know in the, in the younger patients where my, you know, addition of mitostorin or another FLIP3 inhibitor is standard of care, we, we, we intuitively feel that you know, uh, adding addition of a FLIP3 inhibitor is very important for these patients. It's just a matter of proving that in a trial. So I'm hoping with longer follow-up and more patients, we can make a very clear case that you know, addition of a FLIP3 inhibitor, in this case specifically gilteritinib, is an important component of uh, treatment for you know, older patients who are unfit for intensive chemotherapy. Mm -hmm.